It is a terrible thing to lose hope. It's a terrible thing to live in fear. Fear can debilitate. Fear can smother you. And when fear smothers you into despair, you begin to believe that there's no dawn coming. There's no end to this night. That it will never be better, whatever it is. That the pain will never subside. That your family will never improve. That your, your prayers will never be answered. That whatever it is that you're going through, well, the dawn will never come. But when you live with that kind of fear and that kind of hopelessness, you need to know that the message of Easter is that everything changes. Easter comes and a message that says that the night will not last and that our greatest fear will not prevail is the message of this day. It is a message that says not only does God love us, and he does, but that God will ultimately overcome. Easter is the promise that although the night is dark, the dawn is surely coming. One of the reasons I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we celebrate on this Easter day, one of the reasons I believe it is because the the first disciples of Jesus didn't. At least they didn't immediately, not at first. Their, Their reluctance to believe had to be overcome. The first Easter is not some triumphant symphony of trumpets blaring. It is a picture that gradually and even slowly comes into view. Jesus doesn't announce his victory with lights and loud speakers. It it is more mysterious than magnificent. It is more confusing than celebrative. Some of the greatest skeptics were his own followers. And then something happened And fear gave way to faith, and the world has never been the same. I want to take you back to that first resurrection day. Only many years later was the word Easter used. That first resurrection day, again, was ending without a big celebration or a parade. The disciples were still, as the late afternoon hours began to turn into evening, they were huddled in fear. They were gathered that night behind locked doors. They had heard conflicting reports throughout the day. There were the reports about the empty tomb, and they had gone and confirmed that for themselves. And then throughout the day, there were these spotty, isolated reports of people who claimed they had seen Jesus alive. But everyone knows dead people don't come back to life. Hope as you might, wish as you want, death is the great irreversible. And they knew that Jesus was dead. That much was certain. And while a few people had claimed to experience something, and most of them were women, that had to be filtered through what those men knew about their understanding of how the world worked. There had been strange reports. There were two traveling to Emmaus, and they had claimed to see or experience something, and they were truthful, reliable witnesses. But again, just because somebody claims to have experienced something doesn't make it so. Most of us in life, and I suspect this is true about you, have developed a healthy skepticism. Just because somebody says something is true doesn't make it true. Just because somebody says they've experienced something doesn't make it true. In fact, a little skepticism is healthy. It keeps you from turning into a complete fool. So well-balanced types don't normally believe everything that is claimed, even if they're polite about it. And of course, the strange reports notwithstanding, their situation was as bleak as it ever was, which is why they were hiding that late afternoon, early in the evening in fear. Their lives were in danger. Whatever small burgeoning movement they happened to be a part of had been crushed. Their leader was gone. Their enemies were empowered and emboldened, and their lives were at risk. Their future was more muddied than ever. And so it was as the afternoon hours faded into evening, a small group of his disciples gathered behind locked doors. The smell of fear and failure still permeated the air. And then in a moment, 
everything changed. And I am convinced that what changed for them can change for you. I am convinced that what happened on that Easter day can also turn your fear into faith, your hopelessness into hope, and your despair into joy. I want to invite you to take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of John. It's the fourth of the four Gospels, the biographies of Jesus. And there in John chapter 20, we read about that first, well, Easter Sunday, that resurrection day. In John 20 and verse 19, we read about the story that I just referred to. It's late in the afternoon. Evening is coming on. And in John 20, 19, a group is gathered there, a group of his disciples. John 20 and verse 19 records the story happening this way. And one of the things we love to do at Calvary is we just stand when we read the Word of God as we begin to study. And maybe right there in your home, right there with your family, if you're able to, you would just stand as a way of reverencing God's Word. But listen closely to what God's Word says. When it was evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, so the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Would you pray with me? Father, we too find ourselves in extraordinary circumstances on this Easter day, 2020. In a very real way, some of us feel like we are gathered behind locked doors, huddled in fear. Some have lost hope. Some are sinking into despair. But just like those disciples experienced something on that resurrection day, a truth that forever changed their life, God help us to see a truth on this Easter which will change our lives, which will melt our hopelessness away and give us a hope that nothing can overcome is our prayer in Jesus name amen and you may be seated (laughs) this was the day that everything changed and this could be the day that everything changes for you the same thing that changed everything then could be the truth that changes everything now Everything, their faith, their lives, their understanding of what was true, what was possible, literally everything changed. The world itself was turned on its side. Reality was redefined, and it all happened there in a locked room on a Sunday evening in Jerusalem. When suddenly, without a knock, and without a sound, and without warning, Jesus appeared. He stood in their midst, and they were frightened the way men and women are frightened when the incomprehensible transpires. It's the kind of fear that is really more like an awe, the kind of awe that comes when something happens that your mind can't really comprehend and your heart can't absorb. Your mouth falls open, your tongue goes dry, your heart seems to stop, and you can no more speak than you could fly, that kind of fear. And then in their midst, he spoke. He wasn't a ghost. This wasn't some spirit. This wasn't some metaphysical apparition. He wasn't a psychological hallucination. That would have been easier to understand, easier to explain. This wasn't. He stood there transformed and yet the same. It was Jesus. His body that had been battered and tortured just a few days ago was now healed and whole. It was his body, and yet there were still scars that could be felt. You could touch him, and he invited them to. According to Luke's account, he ate with them and told them specifically, it is not a ghost. It is I, flesh and bone. He assured them as their minds tried to assimilate 
this irrational reality. He was the same, yet he was resurrected. He appeared like the wind. The locked door was still locked, and yet there he was. They gasped for air. It was the longest time before they could speak or move. There he was, and from that moment, everything changed. And after that, the doors would be unlocked. And how? Within a few days, they would share a message that has traveled since around the world. He is risen. He is risen indeed. They would launch a movement that has changed the world and continues still. Indeed, for many of you, you can remember the time you heard it. You can remember the time you really believed that it was true. And in that moment, everything changed. This is the truth that changes everything. Perhaps you are in this Easter season filled with fear. Perhaps the failures of the past have bolted the doors to a better future. Can Easter unlock the doors? Yes, it can. Jesus gave them, offered them, told them three things that day. Three things that changed everything. And on this Easter Sunday, these are the three things I want you to see. You notice them specifically in verses 21 and in verse 22. Jesus brings three things. Things, three things that restore our hope. Number one on this Easter, he gave them peace. He gave them peace. Notice what he said there for the second time in verse 21 peace to you. Those were his first words in verse 19 as he stood in their midst, appearing to them, Peace be with you. Those are the first words. Now, that greeting, peace be with you, is a typical Jewish greeting. But this is clearly more than a perfunctory, how are you doing? It's a prayer for peace. He offers it twice. He brings us peace. On this Easter, Jesus offers peace. And peace is what they most needed in that moment. They were frightened, as you can imagine, they would have been frightened. Beyond that, they had experienced every single range of emotion, heartbreaking emotion over the previous three days. They had been stressed, they had been devastated, they had been frightened, they had been overwhelmed, they had been anxious, they had been grief-stricken. Sound familiar? Their world had been decimated. And now in a moment, Jesus offered what they needed most, peace. And he offers the same to you. Peace is more than the absence of conflict. It's more than a cessation to hostility. It is more than the absence of a thing. It is the presence of a thing. Peace is contentment. Peace is calmness amidst the storm. Peace is certainty amidst the chaos. It is gratitude in all our circumstances. Peace is when we trust in the providence of God. It is knowing that I am loved. It is knowing that my sins are forgiven. It is a confidence that when the future seems scary and unhinged and death itself looms somewhere down the road we walk, Peace is being able to say, I will not fear because I know that he is with me. I know that because he lives, I too will live. Because he rose, I too will rise. Do I understand all the mysteries? No. Do I have all the answers? No. Do I know everything the future holds? No. But somehow... Jesus comes and grants me peace, and it doesn't matter what I don't have. When I have that, I have everything I need. I know him. I trust him. I have believed in him, and I am at rest. You need peace today. We need peace. And I want you to know on this Easter day that there is a peace that only God can give you. There is a peace. It doesn't come with the security of a job. It doesn't come with the security of a paycheck. There's a peace 
that only Jesus can bring. It's peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's our separation from God that brings a lack of peace. The Bible gives us an insight into why there is so much brokenness in the world. There is brokenness on the inside of us. There is brokenness all around us. Our world is broken because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is why there is death and suffering and pain and sickness. Because the story of mankind is the story of having rejected God. You may not feel this, but you're in rebellion against God when you refuse his rule over our lives. And the wages of sin is death. There is brokenness within. There is brokenness around. And that is why there is a lack of peace. And when there is a lack of peace, there is no applause. There is no money. There is no pleasure. There is nothing in this world that can fill that void. But Jesus Christ came to bring us peace. The message of the Bible is that he died on the cross for our sins. He died in our place as a substitute, as a sacrifice for us. The message of the gospel is the message of a God who loves us and he took our guilt and he suffered on our behalf. In some real sense, Christ died for us. Jesus died for you. But the story doesn't end there. He was buried, and then he rose from the dead to demonstrate God's power over sin and death. He offers new life and forgiveness to all who would believe on his name. And peace with God comes through Jesus. It does not come through religion. It does not come through moral behavior. It does not come through your own wisdom or your own efforts. It does not come through a church or a priest or a religious edict. It comes from Jesus. He alone can give us peace with God. The risen Savior said, peace be with you. And on this Easter Sunday, I want you to know this. Jesus can give you that peace today. He's the one who offers peace. And through Jesus, you can have peace with God. Jesus said, peace be with you. And then look at the next thing that Jesus said there in verse 21. He said, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Jesus gave them his peace. And secondly, on that Easter, Jesus gave them his purpose. He gave them a new direction and a new purpose in life. He said, as the Father has sent me, now I am sending you. This is John's version of what we sometimes call the great commission. That is the great purpose in life. The purpose of Jesus would now become their purpose. And for those who experienced the resurrection of Jesus, there was no going back. Their life suddenly, dramatically had a new purpose. And that's what happens when you meet Jesus. It's what happened to those disciples. Their lives would never be the same. I think one of the greatest arguments for the authenticity of the resurrection is what happened next. It's what happened to those disciples. How do you explain what happened next? How do you explain the movement of the Christian church? Jesus would leave, and yet the movement that proclaimed him as Lord over all would explode upon the scene and it has literally traveled around the globe. There is no name that is so beloved. More books and more songs have been written about Jesus than any other figure in all of human history and there isn't a close second. He has inspired the greatest works of art known to man. More institutions, and I'm not just talking about churches, but hospitals and schools and charities are founded in his name than any other. Why do you still think today, whenever there's a disaster, what do you hear about? The Red Cross, the Salvation Army, Samaritan's Purse. Around the globe, more people do more, give more, love more in his name 
than any name. Millions worship him and would lay down their lives for him. Indeed, they have rendered their lives to him in service. The author and pastor John Ortberg wrote, we don't know really what Jesus actually looked like, and yet he is the most recognizable figure in the world. And how do you explain that? Why did these disciples, this this small group of people, locked in a room on that Sunday evening, why did they leave that room and disseminate that message around the world? Why did they devote the rest of their lives? Their lives did not become easier. Their lives became harder. In fact, every single one of them, except for one, would die martyred, a violent death at the hands of others who were threatened by this message. Now, people may die for a lie that they believe to be true. They can be sincere and be sincerely wrong. But people will not die for what they know to be a lie. And these disciples knew that either their message that Jesus was risen was a lie or it wasn't. They weren't speculating here. This wasn't some philosophy here they pulled out of the air. They had either seen Jesus alive or they hadn't. There's only two possibilities. And the entire Christian faith rises or falls on that one claim. They would spend the rest of their lives, they would go to their graves saying, Jesus is risen, Jesus is Lord. See, the resurrection is either all important or it's either unimportant. There's no middle ground. The thing about Jesus is this. He's not somewhat important. It's either the greatest thing that ever happened in human history or it's one of the most tragic hoaxes and it should be dismissed. Jesus is either worthy of our worship or he deserves to be despised and rejected. The one thing he cannot be is somewhat important. And what the resurrected Jesus did that day is he gave the people in that room a new purpose and they would spend the rest of their lives living for Jesus. And let me tell you, when you become convinced that Jesus is alive, that he is risen from the dead and he is the Lord, you will understand this. It is the greatest news in all of history. And he does deserve to be worshipped. And when you meet Jesus and you know Jesus, it will give your life a new meaning and a new purpose and a new direction. It could be that this is the day that changes everything in your life. Jesus brought them peace. Jesus brought them a new purpose. Then there's a third thing I want you to see. There in verse 22, after saying this, verse 22 says, He breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. He gave them his peace, he gave them his purpose, he gave them his presence. Receive the Holy Spirit. See, the Christian understanding of God is is that God is one. There's only one God. And yet, the one true living God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All three, all at once. Now, this concept is beyond our ability to fully comprehend. And where did we get it? It came from Jesus. He is the one who declares, whoever's seen me has seen the Father. Then in the last hours of his life, he began to tell the disciples that he would be leaving. But that in another sense, he would never leave us. In fact, he said in John chapter 14 and verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans. In that same chapter, which happened just days before he went to the cross, He said in John 14 and verse 16, I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. Jesus was telling of another who would come. He calls him here a counselor. The word can be translated as a counselor, or sometimes it's translated as a comforter. The word literally means one who comes alongside us. He is the spirit of truth, or as it says in chapter 14, verse 25, the Holy Spirit. 
and he will be with you forever. Jesus said he will literally be in you, not just beside you. So on this resurrection day, Jesus breathed on them and commanded them to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, it would actually be a few weeks later at the Jewish feast of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit would come in power and indwell those who believed in him. But Jesus here speaks the truth that the Holy Spirit has come. Jesus left, but Jesus came in a new way, more powerful even than before. Here's what you need to understand. We who are followers of Jesus, don't speak of him as some distant figure in the past, but we speak of him as a close companion in the present. We sometimes, and and I admit, if you're kind of on the outside looking in, this can be confusing because we talk about phrases like a personal relationship with God, which is to distinguish from merely knowing about God. See, there's a great difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. Jesus has come that we might know him, that we might receive his spirit as a father, as a companion. For us, it's personal. It's real. Now listen, I absolutely get that this will be disparaged by skeptics and dismissed by cynics. It doesn't surprise us. I know it must sound strange when people talk about knowing God or speaking with Jesus or hearing his voice in our hearts. The idea of companionship with a spirit probably sounds like a qualifier for a mental test for sanity. Test away, though, because there are millions of people. Look, I get there are some unbalanced people who talk about God in ways that that are imbalanced and unstable, but let me, let me just, setting that aside, there are millions of people who are otherwise of sound mind and body, who don't see ghosts, who don't talk to spirits, who don't talk to dead people, but will tell you today that they have a personal relationship with God. For us, it's more than believing. It's knowing. It's feeling. We can't help but tell you what we've experienced. And if that makes us crazy, then we are crazy because of Christ. We have experienced his presence. We have felt him. He has moved in our hearts. We have heard his voice there. We have witnessed his work. There are times when he feels as close as someone's breath on the back of our neck. Disparage this if you must, but no that Jesus rose to give us his presence. To say he is alive is to believe that he is alive and he is present. He is with us. And hear our testimony. Knowing about God is not enough. Believing in God is not enough. If by belief you simply mean intellectual assent. To have religion, to accept a creed, or have a family tradition is not enough. Jesus has come, he is risen, so that he can live within us, to indwell us, to fill us, to change us. And we long for you to know the presence of the risen Christ. If there is anything we need in this time of tumult, it is the assurance that God is with us. And the resurrection of Jesus means that he is alive. That means he is here and he is with us. Hear his words today. Receive the Holy Spirit. He's come today to give you peace. He's come today to give you a new purpose. He's come today that you might experience his presence. You say, Pastor Willie, how do I experience that? How do I accept that? Let me give you just two words. Number one, believe it. Believe it. Believe that it is true. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died for you on a cross, that he is risen from the dead. Believe that he is the Lord. Believe not in the sense of mere you know, intellectual acceptance, as I mentioned earlier, but believe in the sense of, fully trusting. Like when you believe in someone, you trust them. Trust Jesus today. Believe in him today. The Bible says 
that if you will confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Even the disciples had a hard time believing it was true. They did. That's why Jesus said in verse 20, did you see it in your Bible? He showed them his hands and his side. They had the same trouble comprehending as you would have had if you were there. Maybe the same trouble you're still having today. Yet when they could arrive at no other conclusion but that he was risen and risen indeed, they did believe and they rejoiced. And I want you to know something on this Easter. The resurrection of Jesus, more than any single fact, is the truth that has turned skeptics into believers. I invite you to examine the evidence yourself. How else do you explain the empty tomb? No one could have taken his body, nor would they have wanted to. Even if the disciples could have stolen him away, which they couldn't, why would a bloodied corpse have inspired a movement? How else do you explain the eyewitness reports? It wasn't just one person on one day or just even one mass gathering. It was multiple people over a period of weeks. This doesn't fit any type of description of hallucination or conspiracy or anything else. How else do you explain the changed lives? How else do you explain what happened to those fearful disciples? Because in a few days, they unlocked the doors, they stepped into the streets, and they changed the world. How else do you explain the people that you know who believe in and trust in Jesus, not to mention the millions throughout human history. How do you explain the impact of Jesus that knows no ethnic, no national, no racial, no political, no geographic boundary? This Easter season, I couldn't help but remember that just a year ago, I was actually in Jerusalem. It was March a year ago, just a few weeks before Easter. I was in Jerusalem, and I went to the garden tomb. The garden tomb is a site that many people visit. It's a place of an empty tomb. We don't know that it's the actual tomb of Jesus, but it is an ancient garden that was excavated, and there is an ancient tomb that is most importantly empty, and and it was right next to a, a hill that looks like a skull. So for many years, people have seen it as at least possibly the tomb of Christ, and more importantly, because it's been preserved and kept, it looks like a tomb would have looked like then. I was there about a year ago, as I've been several times, and they have a place where you can walk through, see the hill that looks like a skull, and walk back and step into this empty ancient tomb. And then there's a place where you can celebrate communion with your friends, the group that has come. And I had a moment as our group was gathering that I was just walking through the ground, just not a terribly large place, but large enough that a variety of groups are always there at once, just cycling through. As I walked through that garden tomb right outside the walls of Jerusalem. I was moved by something I saw, something I had seen all week long. I walked by one group of Ethiopians, beautiful African people. They were gathered and singing in a language I didn't recognize, but a melody that I did. I turned a corner and there was a group of Russian believers and they were just sharing the message of the resurrection. And then there was a group of Ukrainians and, and then there was a, a group of Koreans, a large group of Koreans had just come in and they were singing festive songs, all they were singing. And, and, then, and then there was a group of Brazilians and, and then finally I found my little group of Americans and, and I thought to myself, is there another movement, is there another person in the history of the world that defies racial, geographic, political, national boundaries, that brings people of every color and every race and every tribe and every tongue together who come together to worship Jesus as the risen Savior. People around the world believe in him. Why do you think that is? I think the most plausible answer is The tomb is empty, and he is risen. You have to believe it. Are you willing to believe it? Are you willing to put your trust in Jesus now? Believe it. And here's the second word and the last word I want to give you. Receive it. Believe it and receive it. Jesus commanded them to receive the Holy Spirit. That is, there must be an intentional, deliberate choice to receive Jesus as Savior. 
The Bible says, but to all who did receive him, he gave the right to become the children of God. To those who choose to receive him. When the earliest followers of Jesus talked about what it meant to receive him, in fact, they gave an explanation for this just a few weeks after this. A few weeks after this, it was the Feast of Pentecost, and Peter, one of those disciples who was in the room that Easter Sunday evening, was preaching the message. And in Acts 2, 38, he, he had been preaching, and, and, and you read the message in Acts 2, and he, he said, uh, and, and there were crowds still gathered in Jerusalem, he said, you people heard what happened. Jesus was crucified. He was killed, but he was raised again from the dead. And as he shared that message, people began to cry out, and they said, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Maybe you're asking that question. What do I need to do? Peter said, repent and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, receive the Holy Spirit on that Easter Sunday. What does it mean? It means to repent, to turn around. You have to be willing to change your mind about God. You have to be willing to acknowledge that you have been in control. You've been the master. You've been living your life for yourself, rejecting God. There has to come a point where you turn around and choose to receive him. Believe it, he is risen. Receive it. Turn and open your heart and put your trust in him. Believe it and receive it. The doors were locked on that Easter Sunday night. And perhaps the doors are locked in your life. Perhaps you're crippled by failure or fear. Perhaps you found yourself battling despair. But I have good news to everyone huddled in a locked room today, worried about the future. Jesus is alive. He unlocks the door to a greater future, one that he is Lord over, a greater future than you could ever imagine on your own. On this Easter Sunday, if you have never made the choice to believe him and to receive him, I want to invite you to do so. In fact, right where you are, could I ask that you would bow your head and close your eyes? Has there ever been a time when you chose to put your trust in him, that you chose to receive him as your Savior? I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know there is nothing more important than that decision. It was the day that changed everything for those few disciples locked in that room. And this is the day that could change everything for you. Would you put your trust in him? Would you receive him today? You can do it right there where you are. You could pray a prayer in your heart to God. You might just pray something like this, Dear Father in heaven, today I do believe that you loved me and sent Jesus to die on the cross in my place for my sin. And I do believe that by your power you raised him from the dead. And today I believe Today, I put my trust in you. Today, I want to receive your offer of forgiveness. And I want to receive your Holy Spirit to come and live inside my heart. Today, I trust in you. Please forgive me. Please come into my heart. Be my Savior. And as you're still praying today, if you've made that decision, before you log off today, I want you to go on to that calvary.us connect card. There's going to be a place there for you to let us know that you've prayed to put your faith in Jesus. We want to know that today. We'd love to follow up with an email just to help you know how to take that next step with Jesus. Would you let us know today that you've made the decision? 
to believe in him. We want to pray for you, and we want to help you as you continue your relationship with Jesus. If you're a believer today and you found yourself hiding in fear, (laughs) frightened about the future, hey, friend, the room of the church may be empty, but that's not the point. The point is the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive, and there is hope. He has overcome. He has overcome it all. You can trust him. Father, for everyone hiding in a way behind a locked door, fearful about tomorrow, may the message of this day that a Savior is risen, Jesus is alive, and he has come to us today to offer us peace. He has come today to offer us purpose. He has come today to offer us his own presence. Father, help us to believe it and receive it today. This could be the day that changes everything. May it be the day that changes everything in our lives. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.